Tonight I'm speaking on the subject of the doctrine of divine healing. And I want to read to you out of the book of Hebrews and the first chapter, beginning to read at verse 1 and reading down through verse 4. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Pause right there. This really, in essence, is the theme of the book of Hebrews. It reminds us as we enter into the writing, whoever the author might be, the authorship of Hebrews is debated. But what is absolutely clear is he's drawing in the opening words that there is a line that separates two covenants. God, through the Old Testament, spoke through the prophets and their patriarchs and ancestors. But now in the final days, this represents the New Testament covenant. Which is why fundamentally we have a Bible of closed canon, but it is divided into two separate identities. The Old Testament and the New Testament. As I've been teaching our students this week, understanding that there are two covenants in the Bible is foundational to properly understanding text and context. You must understand in your knowledge of the Bible that there is an eternal covenant with God's chosen people. But there is a new covenant whereby Gentiles were invited into fellowship with God by faith in Christ. And we have the covenant to the church in what is oftentimes called the church age. And so remember that because that's not only important in understanding how to render eschatology and end time events. That's why there is so much misinformation on eschatology and Bible prophecy. Is Many people do not know that you even interpret eschatology by the context of is it coming from the mouth of the old covenant or is it coming from the mouth of the new covenant? Is God speaking in this text to the Jews exclusively, or is he speaking to New Testament believers and Gentiles? I bring that up to you at the beginning of this message because the same is such for healing. Much of the misinformation and misunderstanding on the doctrine of divine healing is because people do not know how to place healing in the New Testament covenant. Healing in the Old Testament did not fashion itself in any way as it is found in the New Covenant. Thank you for all those amens. That's why we take the offering first. But now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the sun, he created the universe. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. He sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we never open up the sacred Bible without a deep awareness that we are in need of the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. The greatest mentor, the greatest teacher ever given was the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. As we start in the Bible and stay in the Bible and finish in the Bible tonight, I ask you for the anointing and the strength and the stamina to communicate the Word of God in clarity. And I pray that you'll help me to make it clear enough that those that are listening, even online, many of which perhaps have never received Christ, or maybe infant Christians, and they're just beginning to learn these great passages of the Bible. 
help me to make clear to them in a way that they'll know that just as every sinner in the world has the privilege to call upon God for salvation, every believer has the privilege and the divine right to call upon God for divine healing. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And when I give the invitation at the end of our time together for people to turn from sin and turn to Christ, I pray that all who are listening and all who are watching online, wherever you may send this content, if they do not have a certainty and a peace that they're right with God and living ready in these last days, remind them that Jesus Christ died for sinners And there is no sin in their life. There is nothing in their past greater than the grace of God. And I pray you'd give them the courage and the faith and the humility to pray that sinner's prayer with us. And may they lay their head to the pillow tonight with an absolute knowledge. My sins are forgiven. I'm right with God. I'm ready to go. In Jesus' name we pray. We also ask that as we anoint with oil and pray for the sick, that signs and wonders and miracles would follow the preaching of your word. We're asking you, Father, to baptize this campus with a fresh oil that releases signs and wonders and miracles. We pray that our students might visibly see demonstrations of God's power as they're studying scripture here. I pray that it would be validated with remarkable signs from God that will settle every doubt. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said amen. I don't have time to teach on the book of Hebrews. At a later time, I'll come back to this for our student body. But the entire book of Hebrews consists of three powerful themes. As always, I ask you every time I speak, and I'm speaking to our students, Uh, If you'd like to do the same, I hope it will be a help to you. But always bring a Bible, always bring a way of taking notes, and always bring a highlighter so that you can highlight some of these classic passages. In your Bible, I do the same every Sunday morning when Judy and I go to church and I sit down to listen to my own pastor. But the three dominant themes of Hebrews, number one, a better high priest, number two, a better covenant, and number three, a better promise. Understanding those three themes is the best way to understand the reading of the book of Hebrews. The author is telling us that through Christ we have a better high priest. In the old times, in the old covenant, in the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets and our ancestors. But now in these final days, he speaks to us through his son. Jesus Christ is a better high priest. Jesus Christ is a better covenant. And Jesus Christ is a better promise. If you dare to believe and receive that, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. And as you continue to read through the book of Hebrews, we go into the 8th chapter. And in the 8th chapter, in the 6th and 7th verse, it's replicated again for all to see. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. And so this is not my speculation. This is not my theological bias as to what I think the three themes of Hebrews are. The author blatantly said so. And that is important, especially in understanding New Testament covenant and New Testament doctrine. Now with that said, tonight I'm preaching on the doctrine of divine healing. Why would I lead in with the book of Hebrews? Because you cannot properly understand divine healing if you're going to completely cross-reference Old Covenant with New Covenant. 
because the covenant of healing and the covenant of salvation that we have access to did not begin until the cross of Christ and the shed blood of the spotless lamb and not only by his death, not only by the shedding of his blood, but thank God by his resurrection and by his promise of soon coming. We have a living Christ. Our Christ is not crucified lying in a tomb. He was risen from the dead. His ascension was witnessed. Hundreds, including unbelievers, were visible testimonials that Jesus Christ, God's only son, is the living savior and he's coming soon. Tomorrow night, that will be my concluding message. The doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Over 400 times mentioned in the Bible that Jesus Christ one day will return. And when he returns, I'll not only give him praise for my salvation, I'll give him praise for my health and for my healing and for my sustenance for the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens your mortal body. Hallelujah. In one of the translations, I believe it's the original New Living Translation, verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1 reads this way. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. I share that verbiage for those of you who perhaps are brand new Christians and you have your grandmother's King James version or perhaps an older version that's difficult to read and I'm not in any way criticizing the King James version. That's the only Bible I had until I came to Bible college and I love it. I've memorized close to 2,000 verses of the Bible out of the King James because that's all I had growing up pretty much. As a matter of fact, a Schofield King James version. But if you think I'm going to re-memorize 2,000 verses of the Bible out of a modern translation, probably not going to happen, not so much. So many times when you hear me quote passages, I quote from the King James because that's what's in my mind and memory and spirit. But I love, especially for new believers, because that's my heart as an evangelist, for unreached people, for unsaved people, for brand new believers, for the man or the woman or the boy or the girl that just got saved hours ago. When I do my final edit on anything I speak, I ask God, Lord, help me to say this in such a way that even children who are listening can clearly find their way to the foot of the cross. And I think Hebrews 1.3 says it in such a clear way. Everything about Jesus, Hebrews 1.3, Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Now, if you're going to understand divine healing, let me help you with something. To understand divine healing, as I've already stated and given evidence to from Scripture, it is a new covenant through Christ. Just as salvation was conceived and purchased on the cross, so was divine healing. And the ministry of Jesus Christ bore witness to that, that he had unlimited power to do the work and the will of the Father. But the covenant was sealed by the shed blood of an innocent lamb. Now, you can imagine being in ministry for 43 years, I've debated divine healing with a lot of people who don't fully understand it. There are some who believed that some of these things no longer exist, that they ceased, that they were terminated, that they were only for a season. But I'll not get into the debate of that. I do have YouTube videos on that. If you want to study the apologetic of why we believe in divine healing. But I am going to go over a few things with you tonight before we pray that are commonly asked. And perhaps one of the most common questions for people who struggle in under, understanding divine healing is this, or something like this. Well, if it's God's will to heal, why do godly Christians 
sometimes get sick and even die? That's a good question. And scholarship should never run from question. Nor should it try to skirt the issue. Nor should it just take the stance, well, that's what you believe, that's not what I believe. You should be able to open up a Bible. Listen carefully. We sometimes do a good job of teaching people what we believe. But we often do not a good job in teaching why we believe. Many times constituents can tell their unsafe family what they believe, but the moment they're confronted with a difficult question, the well's too shallow, and the scholarship has been lazy, and they have no answer. I really pray for our student body that part of your prayer life will be in the prayer room. Lord, while I'm here, teach me the process and the disciplines to dig into the scriptures, to know not only what I believe, but to be able to explain why I believe. Because the book of James tells us we should be ready to give an answer to those who ask of us. And the word in the Greek is apologia. And that's where we get the term apologetics, which is a field of study of giving evidence and proof and substance. Here is not only what I believe, here is why I believe. And so it's a great question, and it doesn't upset me when people say, well, if you believe in divine healing and that to be the will of God. Well, my pastor was one of the godliest people I ever knew, and he got killed in a motorcycle accident. Or he died of cancer when he was 44, and the stories go on and on. First of all, let me lay down a biblical absolute. Listen carefully. This is a biblical absolute. The first thing you must settle in your Christian faith is that whatever the Bible says stands above all. Let me explain that a little deeper. You cannot take life experiences and life illustrations and life mishaps and difficult things that have happened and hold them as co-equal to the scripture. You must settle in your heart. I may not understand everything this side of glory, but Father, I purpose in my heart that by faith I hold the Bible high and I do not allow anything to be co-equal to thus saith the Lord. My life experiences will not be held co-equal to thus saith the Lord. Because we've all had those questions. I buried my first grandson. I understand your question. But the Bible says in Psalm 138 and verse 2, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. The Bible must never share a seat of co-equality with your life experiences. You must always bring your life experiences that are difficult subservient to the integrity of the truth of God. Can I hear a good North Point? Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 23 verses 25 and 26. You must serve only the Lord your God. I'm very well aware of the fact that I'm in the Old Covenant. I want you to see that the types and the shadows and the foundations of these things were even in the Old Covenant as well, but not completely fulfilled until the cross. But all the way back in Exodus, if you do, I will bless you with food and water. I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land, and I will give you long, full lives. Verse 26 in the King James Version, I believe, says, The number of your days I will fulfill. 
So even in the old covenant, God had provided a way to take sickness from the midst of the people. That means that some people just died by wearing out and falling asleep and went home without sickness. Now, why would I say that? Because I've heard people say concerning sickness and divine healing, well, you got to die of something. Did it ever occur to you that God said, the number of your days I will fulfill? Did it ever occur to you that God said, with long life I will satisfy thee? Did it ever occur to you that there is the potential in faith to walk in the obedience of God's will, His work, and His word, and to carry out all of your assignments, and to go to bed one night, and to be peacefully taken home to be with the Lord? And I could tell you many stories of men and women of God that that's exactly what happened. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, the scripture said, But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. What was the standard? Perfection. Well, let me ask you a question. If there's someone listening to me tonight and you're present and you're perfect, please stand up. I'd like to identify the biggest liar in New England. <laughs> and then the scripture says, there is none perfect. No, not one. Contradiction in the Bible? Absolutely not. God's standards of all doctrine are given in the context of perfection. That's God's standard. Everything God teaches in doctrine is not given with an escape clause for your sinful nature. Everything God teaches, He teaches in the standard of perfection because God is perfect. His law is perfect. His word is perfect. His will is perfect. So it helps sometimes for people in understanding the doctrine of divine healing that in the perfection of divine healing, just like there's a target, visually imagine a target. And the center of the bullseye is perfection. Does everybody who lives for God hit the center of the bullseye in everything they do, everything they say, everything they believe, and everything that they experience? Well, of course not. But that does not negate the standard that the standard of perfection given by God is still the target. Let me give it to you in another way that might help a different level of intellect. We live in a day and an age in which much preaching is trying to take the standard of God and bring it down to a level where common men can reach it, often predicated by a misinterpretation of grace. And let me just make a quick statement on that as long as my feet are there. Any teaching on grace that gives you a comfort level with personal sin is heresy. Any teaching on grace that makes you feel comfortable with sin and iniquity and perversion and carnality is heresy. Paul said, should I continue in my sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. God does offer grace to the sinner. But that grace of God is not a license for you to keep living as if nothing changed. There is a commitment and a consecration. And what's the bullseye of God's standard? Be thou perfect. So it is always wrong in ministry to take the standards of God and try to make them quote unquote relevant. And in doing so, you lower the high standard of God down to a level where people can reach them without salvation, can reach them without changed behavior can reach them without giving up sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ 
must be preached fearlessly in such a way that we call men and women and boys and girls to strive to reach the high standards of God with an understanding that only the infilling of the Holy Spirit and salvation can take a mere man and give him ability to be what God has called him to be. 1 Peter 1 and 16, for the scripture says, you must be holy, for I am holy. Is anyone as holy as God? No, I read that to you as another example that God, as he's teaching us levels and standards, always points us towards the dead center of the bullseye. So doctrine must be preached without compromise. Doctrine must be preached without compromise. And we must always take the hands of men and women and boys and girls who are saved and say, here's the goal. And the goal is holiness. The goal is godliness. The goal is perfection. You may fall short of that goal, but don't give up. There's always room for improvement. There's always room for growth. There's always room for greater knowledge. There's always room for a deeper level of consecration. And the modern church needs to come back to what our forefathers used to preach. We need to strive to be like God in all of our ways. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord isn't really slow about his promises, some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. There it is again, perfection, God's will. God said, if I had my perfect will, I'm willing that none should perish. The word none in the Greek means none. I'm willing none should perish, but all should come to repentance. And I don't have time to preach on the doctrine of hell tonight, but let me just say that Jesus very clearly said in Matthew's gospel that hell was not even prepared for the human race. Hell was prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. God doesn't want you to go to hell. Those of you that are watching online, I've oftentimes been asked, how do you say that God is love preacher in one breath and turn around and preach on hell and torment and judgment in your next sermon? That is contradiction, right? No, it is not contradiction. When you understand heaven and you understand hell, God has done everything in his power to make sure you have a clear path to heaven. He's done everything by his son Jesus to make payment for your sin. But he offers salvation to you as a choice. And there's only two things you can do with Jesus. You can receive him or you can reject him. Don't miss what I'm about to say if you're listening from wherever you may be. If you go to hell, you will not be there because God sent you there. You will be there because when he offered you forgiveness... When he offered you salvation, when he offered you Christ, you spit upon his grace and turned your back and you walked away. No one goes to hell because God sent them there per se. They go to hell because when God offered them heaven, they rebelled. And it's like the old restaurants that we used to go to back before they passed smoking laws. Some of you will remember the day when every time you walked into a restaurant, they said, question number one, smoking or non-smoking? When I used to get to the table as an evangelist, I used to flip that question on the waiter or the waitress. You ask me one question, it's only fair I get to ask you one. When you die, smoking or non-smoking? Those laws have changed, and so now I have to take that little brief sermonette to the elevator. When I get on the elevator, are you going up or down, sir? I'm going up before I get off. Sir, let me ask you a question. 
When you die, are you going up or are you going down? Have a good night. God bless. <laughs> the thing that I want you to walk away with tonight, one of the things that I want you to walk away with is this foundational biblical truth and standard is that every doctrine God teaches is the center of the bullseye. Perfection. Holiness like God. All should be saved. All should be healed. Jesus Christ went about and healed them all. But just because, listen carefully, just because in your personal life you have not yet hit the bullseye, do not throw the doctrine of healing out the window as so many have. You may not have even hit the target yet. But if I were to take one of my grandchildren in the backyard, and uh, I've been fairly busy for the last year and haven't had a chance to pick up my bow, but I think if I went home and took you with me and went into my back four acres and I took my bow out, I think I could still put my target at 50 yards and put all of the arrows in a pie plate effortlessly. Now, if I tried to teach that to my grandchildren, well, my bow said it's 70 pounds of pull. They wouldn't even be able to pull it. So in their faith of archery, I would have to get them a bow that they could work with. And if I gave them three arrows and asked them to shoot at the target, and I'd gone over all of the fundamentals of how to knock an arrow, how to hold a bow, how to draw a string, how to hold it exactly, how to release it carefully, and how to hold steady, but their first arrow went straight into the ground, 10 yards short of the target. Total miss. And I said, perhaps to my grandson, Simeon, that was a little low, aim a little higher. And he overcompensated, and the second arrow flew over the target. I said, you're getting better. Just lower it a little bit, somewhere between the first arrow and the second arrow. And the third arrow is released, and it's the perfect height. But it's a little left. And it goes left of the target, but at the perfect height. And he were to throw the bow down on the ground. And I were to say, Simeon, don't be frustrated. What have you learned today? If my grandson learned uh, a lesson in his little young boy's mind and said, Grandpa, I'll tell you what I've learned. I've learned that the target doesn't really exist. I would have to teach him. No. That's not the lesson. Just because you missed it doesn't mean the target didn't exist. It means you have room for improvement in this skill set. And what many people have done in the modern church is because they've never been taught the proper biblical foundations of divine healing and their attempts to try to move in healing or receive healing or to pray healing have fallen short. Many people doctrinally now attend churches that would rather say the target of healing no longer exists when the truth is they've abandoned the biblical precepts that cause your faith to strive until you begin to get on target and begin to move closer and closer to the bullseye. You must understand that God's perfect will in every doctrine he teaches is given to us with bullseye expectation. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 6 through 10. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. 
So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now why did I read that passage as we move to our conclusion tonight? Because no other passage in the New Testament covenant has been more twisted than this passage when it comes to the doctrine of divine healing. Many misleading sermons and spurious statements have led people to question, what should I believe about healing? Because many times I've heard many ministries say this. When you're going through sickness, when you're going through disease, when you're going through infirmity that you seemingly have no answer to, remember the words of Paul. Sometimes God's grace is sufficient. And in your weakness, he is made strong. And people say, well, if God didn't heal Paul from his thorn in the flesh, then I guess I don't have a New Testament covenant basis to believe that he'll, me, he'll heal me and what I'm going through. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness. That is a perversion of biblical text. Paul did not refer to his thorn as sickness. But yet there are many people who try to lay out an argument that Paul was sick. Paul had an unknown infirmity. Oftentimes you'll hear people say Paul was suffering from some type of eye disease. And there are multiple things that are stated. Why would I draw your attention as we come to the close tonight? Because this is the only passage in the entire New Testament that if misunderstood gives people an opportunity to tell you the target doesn't exist. The expectation of healing does not exist. God is sovereign. God does what he wants. He heals who he wants. He moves where he wants and so forth. But the thorn in the flesh that Paul mentioned, let's examine it carefully. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Paul told us what the thorn was. Highlight that in your Bible, students. The thorn in the flesh given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul gave testimony as to where his thorn in the flesh came from. He said it was given to me from Satan, a messenger from Satan. The word messenger in the Greek is angelos which is a word that can describe an angel or a messenger who is dispatched to perform a specific assignment. One notable scholar said it might be best rendered in the minds of young people in the 21st century, an assassin. If his thorn in the flesh had come from God, he would have called it a messenger from God or sent by God, but he did not. He was very specific. And the manuscript was properly rendered. Paul said it was a messenger from Satan. In no way, shape, or form can you properly exegete this scripture and say that it was a sickness in Paul's body. Let's go back to the first text that I read to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, go down to verse 10. Because he gave a deeper description of the thorn. He said, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, hardships, persecutions, troubles, 
that I suffer for Christ. But none of that is sickness. It's a much debated passage. But I can assure you that some of the most respected scholars outside of Pentecostal camp write the exact same proper interpretation. Nowhere did Paul specifically give us the biblical right to definitively state that sickness is sent by God and sometimes we need to accept it because he's sovereign and because Paul said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, whatever it was, and there are many things that it possibly could be. Paul mentioned an individual that followed his ministry who constantly caused him trouble, hardship, attack, assaults. Some believe it was that man. Others believe it to be demonically inspired opposition to his apostolic work. We don't have the specifics of that, but I'll tell you what we do have the absolute specifics on. You cannot say that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a sickness or an infirmity without violating the proper interpretation of Scripture. I have an entire Bible study on that. I would encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and listen to one of our messages entitled, What Was Paul's Thorn in the Flesh?, where I go into much greater detail of the original. I close with this. I love that verse, as I mentioned in the beginning, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. I think it's best understood by brand new believers or people who are searching or seeking. One of the great keys to the book of Hebrews in understanding the New Testament covenant, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Now, I don't think anybody, regardless of denominational bent or bias, would disagree with the fact that everything about Jesus was a perfect representation of the will and the work of God. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus carried out the will of his Father. Jesus testified, I did everything my Father asked me to do. Be sure to write that in your notes. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Because any question in Christian development, Christian discipleship, Christian character always has to go back to what would Jesus do? He's our pattern. Can I hear a good amen? So I close with this. Let me ask you some simple questions. And this is content that deserves its own message. And perhaps in God's leading in time, I'll come back to it. But if Jesus Christ represents the will of God exactly... Let's ask some very fundamental questions. Was Jesus ever sick? We have no record in the Bible of Jesus ever being sick. I remember one time in a restaurant with uh, several people, many of which were true theologians and educated individuals, and the subject came up, but I was the only Pentecostal at the table, so I kept my mouth shut because I was curious to learn their perspective. And then I asked them this question. Do you believe Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3? And discussion was had, and though there were academic credentials at the table, expressly, absolutely, Jesus is the perfect standard of the will of God. I don't think any denomination would ever buck that truth. And then I asked the question, well, you're talking about divine healing. Can I ask just a handful of questions? I close by asking you those handful of questions I asked at the table. Gentlemen, was Jesus ever sick? There was an awkward pause. And the oldest at the table, perhaps the most credentialed at the table, said, well, Brother Tiff, you have to remember that the Scripture also tells us that what we have in the closed canon of Scripture is not everything that happened, that volumes could not contain it all. I said, yes, I'm aware of that. Let me ask you a question. Do we build doctrine off of what the Bible says or what the Bible doesn't say? 
you can only build doctrine off of what the Bible said because God perfectly inspired the writing of Scripture. We believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And it wasn't like God got done with the Bible and one day said, oops, I meant to say this. There is no record of Jesus ever being sick. Matthew 9, 20 through 22, just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well, and the woman was healed at that moment. Not only do we not have any record of Jesus being sick, he walked in a level of health from on high with such power that people who touched him, virtue went out of his clothes and healed people. Question number two, did Jesus ever make anybody sick? There is not one single verse in the New Testament covenant where you will find that Jesus made anybody sick. What are we talking about? Hebrews 1.3, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. Matthew 4, verses 23 and 24, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. The third question I asked at that table, there was a lot of stuttering, by the way. So let me ask a third question. Did Jesus ever tell anybody their sickness was sent from God? Because oftentimes I've heard that. I remember going to a hospital as a young evangelist with a pastor making hospital calls to his congregants. And I remember going in to pray. It asked me, would you come in and pray with one of our deacons? He loves your ministry and his wife's there. She asked if you'd come up. I said, I'd be happy to. When I got to the hotel room, the man that we were going to pray for told the pastor, Pastor, I'm so glad to see you and I appreciate you coming to pray. But I just want you to know I'm convinced that God sent me here and put this disease upon me because I've had an opportunity to witness to the man in the bed next to me. And if God hadn't made me sick, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to share the gospel with that people. And as he was sharing his less than biblical view, the nurse came in with one of those little white cups with medications and pills. And and, uh, she was handing it to him with a cup of water. My Shuttlesworth DNA so desperately wanted to slap those pills across the room. And shout, brother, don't take those pills. They'll make you better. And if you get better, you'll get knocked right out of the center of God's perfect will. You need to stay here and die witnessing to everybody you can. But there is so much contradiction in what people say they believe and what they practice. You don't need to go to the hospital to be a witness. I'm not saying you may not one day be in a hospital for whatever reason. Maybe you're there to watch the birth of your first baby or the birth of your first grandchild. And while in a hospital, you may see somebody that you've known from high school or whatever and God prompts your heart. They're going through a tough time and you offer to pray for them as they're facing something perhaps much more serious. And God gives you an opportunity. But to claim that because something positive comes out of a negative circumstance certainly does not mean it to be doctrinally that's always God's will. I told the students today about the man I heard of in a church that had been in prison and was testifying. You know, I just know God sent me to prison 
My life was such a mess. And when they put me in prison and those prison doors slammed shut, you know, those nights were so cold and so quiet. And I lay there and it was in that nightly time that I began to hear the voice of God and I prayed and repented of my sin. I'm so thankful God sent me to prison for it was there I got saved. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's a good doctrine. Let's all go to prison and get saved. God didn't put him in prison to save him. They threw his rear end in prison because he broke the law. And when he was in prison and the door slammed and he wasn't around his friends and he wasn't around the beer and he wasn't around his drug and he wasn't around his women and there was no music and there was no computer and the volume was completely shut off in his life for the very first time, it was in that silence of his sin that he first heard the still small voice of God. I could go on ad nauseum. Don't build doctrine around personal life experience. You must always build doctrine around Hebrews 1.3. Everything about Jesus represents the will of God. Not your cousin in prison, not your deacon in the hospital, not what may have happened to me or to you. We must always run to the Bible and lift the Bible up as the target of God and focus upon the bullseye and say, God, teach me to develop in such a way that I constantly in my Christian walk am moving closer and closer to the will of God. John 10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That's why I think it's important that we watch what we sing. And don't be insulted if you're a worship leader. But the greatest doctrines of the church were usually not written by the praise team. We need to monitor what we say. We need to monitor what we sing. And it slips in in such subtle ways if you're not careful. He gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. As if God's some psycho that can't make up his mind. Never attribute the works of the devil to the works of God. God does not take away. Sin takes away. Disobedience takes away. Walking away from God takes away. Rebelling against the word of God takes away. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. His first commandment to the human race in Genesis chapter 1 was be fruitful and multiply. Stuff you lose in life is not the hand of God. It's your disobedience or your poor decision making. Your path with God and obedience. He said you will always have good success and I'll cause you to prosper in all of your ways. If you are obedient and you don't turn to the left and you don't turn to the right. A life of holiness will always produce an upward path. It doesn't mean that you don't face obstacle. It doesn't mean that you don't face difficulty. But many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. We do wrestle against demonic powers. We do wrestle against principalities and powers. But the power of he who is in us in regenerated conversion, greater is he who's in me than he who is in the world. Did Jesus ever tell anybody with sickness? I can't pray for you because God gave you this to strengthen your faith. But how many times have you heard teaching on that? Well, you know, sometimes God allows you to go through sickness and disease and cancers. Perhaps he's trying to strengthen your faith. Man, that's bad doctrine. He told us how he builds faith. 
Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you go through a tough time, I am not saying, listen carefully, I am not saying that when you go through a time of affliction that your strength and your faith may not be increased by the battle. But God didn't send sickness to strengthen you any more than you would put sickness upon your own children. That's not how loving parents teach their children. One more question and we pray. Did Jesus ever refuse to heal anyone who asked in faith? Absolutely not. Matthew 8, 1 through 3, large crowds followed Jesus. As he came down the mountainside, suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, be sure you have your Bibles open and highlight this. This is solid gold. Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. Here's an actual illustration of a man confused about the doctrine of divine healing who in innocence said, Jesus, if it's your will, you can heal me. He had heard enough testimonials about the Son of God to know that he had the power to heal. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed, and instantly the leprosy disappeared. As I close with this, don't miss this solid nugget of gold. Before Jesus healed him, he corrected his doctrine. Because the man had a question. Lord, I know if you want to, you're sovereign, you're powerful, I believe you're the Messiah. I, I accept all of that. And so if it is your will to heal me, I believe you have the power to heal me. And many times that's where people are at. It's not that they don't believe in divine healing. They just wrestle on the doctrinal grounds of is it his will to heal me? Is it his will, will to get me through this? But notice that before Jesus healed him, he corrected his doctrine. I will be thou healed. Perhaps better rendered in a 21st century colloquialism. Hey, don't worry about that. It is my will to heal you. And to prove it is my will, will to heal you, the Bible said he prayed for him and he was instantly healed. Matthew 4, 24, whatever their sickness, whatever their disease, if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. You're always going to have questions on difficult doctrines. There were, listen, there will always be personal experiences in your life that you'll be tempted to hold up as co-equal to the integrity of the Bible. But I am challenging you tonight to stand in the promise of the New Testament covenant purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The same blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins is the same blood that was shed for the healing of your body. Just as it is the will of God for people to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, I am willing that none should perish. Why is it that great denominations don't wrestle over that so much? They know it's the same blood. They know it's the same covenant. They know it's the same cross. They know it's the same Christ. They know it's the same application. They know it's received by faith. There is rarely great debate that Jesus can save a sinner. For some reason, there is great debate that Jesus can heal believers. And I declare by the testimonial of a sure foundation of Scripture, just as every sinner has a divine privilege to call upon God for their salvation, 
Every believer has a divine privilege to call upon God for the healing of their body. And I've been in ministry and missions and traveled the world and preached in close to 60 countries of the world, most of them third world. And I say this not to boast in self. I say this to boast on God. I've preached close to 300 times a year for 43 years. I have never missed a service because of sickness, disease, or infirmity. And I say that because all of us know that's not normal. That's not natural. That's not usual. I am quick to say God has kept me supernaturally in a place of health and healing. Have I never had physical infirmity? I've gone through battles. I've faced physical problems. But I knew in that time of battle what to do. I knew what the center of the bullseye of the doctrine of divine healing allowed for me. Father, it's not time for me to go. You called me to win a million souls. I've not yet reached that goal. A man with a mission cannot die. I thank you, Father, that you promised with long life you'd satisfy me. I thank you, Father, that you said even in old age my leaf shall not wither and whatsoever I do it shall prosper. I thank you, Father, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. And just as I know what the doctrine of the covenant of healing provided for me, I then have the ability to go to war for my health without question mark, without wondering, without seeing something happen that says, well, you know, God's grace is sufficient for me. Maybe I should just shrivel up and die today. No, I know it's God's will to keep me. I know it's God's will to help me. And I am here to declare to you tonight, it is God's will to save you. It is God's will to deliver you. It is God's will to heal you. And you have a right all the days of your life to ask God to keep you in strength. If you believe it and receive it, stand to your feet and give God a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's praise him for healing for a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for you tonight. And when I pray for the sick, I do things just a little differently because as I was raised in Pentecost and I certainly am not offering any defamation of my ancestors and my forefathers and my spiritual mentors. But what happened most often in a service like this is we just prayed for the sick. And one day in my own prayer life, I felt like the Lord convicted me. So why don't you pray for people when you pray for divine healing like you pray for yourself? That God will surround you with a holy hedge of divine protection. And every weapon of the enemy formed against your health shall not prosper. Why don't you pray for people like that too? So when we come to these altars tonight, I'm not just praying a prayer of faith for the sick. And I am believing God for signs and wonders and miracles to be a part of this campus on an ongoing basis. Our students need to see and experience the miracles of God for themselves. People say, well, I just don't believe God heals in the 21st century regardless of what you say. Well, that's probably why you've never seen anybody healed. These signs shall follow them that believe. You'll never receive what you don't preach. You get what you preach. The Bible is so powerful when you preach it, it brings it into fruition in the spirit realm before it's done in the tangible realm. Well, I don't believe that we still should be speaking in tongues. I believe that ended in the era of the apostles. Well, that's why you don't have it. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. Unbelievers don't speak in tongues. People who believe in tongues speak in tongues. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. And so as we gather, I'm going to encourage those of you that have a heavenly language. The greatest way to preserve and protect your health is to pray in the Holy Ghost. Because when you pray in English, you only pray with a limited language and a limited understanding. But the Bible clearly tells us that when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness who knows what should be prayed for. And when you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying over things miraculously that your natural mind cannot put into vocabulary. I'm giving you to that as a key to divine health. The Lord taught me many years ago, if you want to walk in supernatural health, spend more time praying in the Holy Ghost. When you need physical repair, when you're praying in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit will pray that over you. Because God knows what the attack is before you ever see it. But that's how we're going to pray. If you're watching online, I promised in our social media advertising, we're going to include you in this prayer as well. But before we pray for the sick, if you're watching, I mentioned that every sinner has the divine right to call upon God for salvation. For 2 Peter 3.9, I'm willing none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's you. There's no sin in your life greater than the forgiveness of God. But you, know, number one, you must recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Repent simply means make a U-turn. You're headed in the wrong direction. Instead of walking in your stubborn way, turn around and say, I'm going to trust God. Number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ. That's the only provision for my sin and for your sin. That's why the Bible tells us Jesus, by his own words, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And I never preach without giving people an opportunity to be saved. And so if you're watching this, wherever you may be in the world, when you pray with me, when you're done, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings. And I've prepared a series of teachings there that are absolutely free. And before you listen to any of my other content, listen to the series of New Beginnings. Because when you give your heart to Christ, this is not the end of what God's going to do with your life. This is just the beginning. And those teachings came from a desire from my heart. I remember praying in the early part of my ministry, Lord, I wish I could go out after church with every person that got saved and sit down and have a cup of coffee and answer their questions and pray with them and help them. So make yourself a cup of coffee or tea and sit down with me and listen to the series New Beginnings because God's about to take you from where you're at to where he created you to be. And the first step is to receive salvation through the repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, just pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I desire the power of God to save me, to heal me, and to deliver me. I recognize and repent of my sin in childlike faith. I ask you tonight, with the blood you shed upon the cross, cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. By faith I now receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior, and I vow right now I will live for him all the days of my life. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and lead me in the path of God. And may I live in such a way that all of my family and all of my friends who follow me make heaven their eternal home. Use me for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, go to lostlamb.org. Everybody's somebody to God, and you're important to me, and I'd love to have the privilege of following up on you.